Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Car Chat Podcast. And with us today, we have Jonathan Wells. Hello. Good afternoon. Hi, Sam. Good, good afternoon. Can you tell the audience a little bit about sort of who you are, what you do? Um, sure. So uh, I'm head of design is my current title at the Morgan Motor Company. I started here just before Morgan enjoyed its centenary year. So just 2009. First started as a... Um, on a on work placement actually while studying automotive design and i joined oh. a very small team then um my predecessor was the first car designer ever employed by morgan um <laughs> and uh we resided in the then r d shed it was called it was a little asbestos clad building at the back of the morgan factory and there was maybe four engineers a couple of fabrication chaps and myself and, and matt yeah, I guess we were all on the start of what was going to be a quite fast moving 10 years. So, um, like I said, I joined as a second designer. Um, my background was particularly focused on 3D design. So taking sketches okay. that Matt was doing at the time and bringing them into a 3D realm, be that a clay model or a, or a, or a CAD model that could then be interpreted by the engineers. With an eye on the principles of car design, I guess. And okay. during that process, um, because we could colour in, I guess we <laughs> inherited the um, a lot of the visual communication straight away. So it was, you know, it's oh, fantastic. Maybe we can use some of these skills for brochures and, and websites. And quite quickly, the design team became a less than typical car design team because we covered then and still cover now all aspects of the brand communications. So photography, video and industrial design. So yeah, that, was, okay. that was 10 years ago. Um, and I've been here pretty much ever since. First <laughs> first and, and first proper job I've ever had, really, I guess. Um, prior to that, I was studying automotive design for four years. Did a few live projects with various companies and you know a few bits of contracting for various people along the way. But um, predominantly, Morgan's where I've been for the last 10 years. So we, back then, looked at the, the classic range of cars. I've worked on several iterations of aero uh, platform vehicle. Um, worked on mm -hmm. the first three-wheeler project, something we'll talk about today, no doubt, because we're now revisiting that. Um, yeah. Lots of different concept cars, everything from hydrogen fuel cells to electric vehicles. And um, nowadays, we live no longer in a little shed at the back of the factory. We now have a purpose-built <laughs> R&D facility and 35,000 square foot of space and, uh, and a much bigger design and engineering team. It's come a long, a, a long way. Right, before we get into all the sort of Morgan stuff, I want to dive back a little bit. Um, studying car design, mm. what what does that involve? <laughs> so um, essentially, an industrial designer occupies a space somewhere between an artist and an engineer. There's there's no way you can um, design a product with any, com any real conviction unless you've got an understanding of um, technical properties of materials, of packaging space, of powertrains, of ergonomic requirements for people, um, this sort of science of interaction with man and machine, I guess. So it's kind of all con all encompassing in that area. There's a big technical backbone to everything, but predominantly you help define the brief and set the product strategy. And then it's a, a process of ideation coming up with visuals and inspirations and, and the parameters and defining how far they can be pushed to help form the brief. Um, and then you gently evolve the design primarily with concepts to make sure you're on the right on the right direction and they could just be something as simple as a sketch um often they're called napkin sketches because they come into mind whilst you're at a restaurant and you've got nothing else to draw on it's yeah. just that initial spark of an idea and then you gently grow that alongside the other specialists in the industry so we work hand in hand with surfacing specialists and, and body structure specialists and electronic specialists and our job i guess really is to sort of guide and direct the way the design's evolving with an eye on what the final product offers the consumer with regard to what it looks like and, and what it functions and how it functions. That initial process of when you start it up and you say, you know, you've got to come up with the brief of the car, is that as, as vague as two-seater sports car? Or it be, it be, can it be, what yeah, can that the, be? The catalyst for that initial project kickoff could be, it could come from any direction. It could be uh, the opinion of a stakeholder in the company. It could be driven by, and more often than not, is driven by impending legislation. So, for example, 
a, a new piece of emissions legislation or safety legislation can massively impact your product offering. That might be the requirement to perform a certain way during pedestrian impact could mean that you need a lot of space between your a surface of your car and your powertrain, for example. It could be a new bit of legislation with regard to where lights are positioned, which means that you've no longer got a low slung sports car and you have a high, a high headlight array on the front of the car, which you end up chasing around everywhere else with the lines. And it can be any number of um, catalysts really to start a project, but more often than not, it's um, a gap in the market, um, the natural need to refresh a product, um, sort of, you know, yeah. after a period of time in the marketplace. Um, a piece of legislation, be that safety or emissions, um, all, all sorts of different catalysts. Yeah, I guess that's the the tricky bit as well. As, as joining Morgan, which had you know quite a long history and a design ethos mm. and stuff, and then I guess you started off lower down the team and you've ended up at top. But how is it quite difficult to sort of bring carry that design forwards? I know people might look at Morgan's and go, yeah. they all look the same. Um, but like, you know, bring that design forward without pissing off people and then yeah. bringing new people in and all that yeah. stuff. So that, I mean, that is the challenge. The thing I probably hear more <laughs> than anything when I introduce myself is more what I do. And, you know, say I'm a designer at Morgan. They go, really? Morgan need design? What do you mean? <laughs> but if you, if you imagine industrial design is, is, is the, uh, any object is the collection of all its parts, right? So yeah. whether you're designing a toothbrush or an entire sports car or just the gear knob in a sports car, it's the same process. You set the brief, what are my parameters, cost, how am I going to make it? Is it feasible? Who's yeah. it for? What, who's it got to appeal to? Once you've got those parameters, you sketch, you draw, you probably make a model because people like to touch things. And still today, every car you see on the road pretty well without exception, at one point would have been sculpted out of clay. Clay is the standard now and still is then for that initial pass at surfacing a car and then that final validation, does it look how I intended it to look? The computer helps. You do a lot of visualization on the computer and rendering, but you know, touching a product really helps. And once you've got a, a final physical model, go through focus groups, costing exercises, design for manufacture, um, and then testing. And whether you're doing that on a single gear knob or a whole car, this process is the same. And Morgan is, is famous really for its bespoking. So a great deal of the work we do would be bespoke tailoring details on the cars for customers. It could just be a new set of dials or a new dashboard or something much more significant, like a whole new body. So that's a big arm of what we do. And then there over every year I've been here pretty well, there's been a fairly major new model launch. Um, the Aero range um, from the Aero Max to the Aero Super Sport, the Aero Coupe and the Series 5 Aero um, were all very different looking full body designs. We had um, yeah. the Life Car was the first major new product design that I worked on, which was a, a radically different shaped hydrogen fuel cell vehicle. Um, and that was an all new body and interior and some of all those parts. Um, Ever GT was another quite elaborate concept car, which looked completely different again. That was a bit of a future vision piece. And we had new three wheeler, which was a ground up body design. After that EV3, the first electric car. Along the way we're doing several uplifts on the classic Morgan. And that was prior to the CX generation, um, which was an all new body and interior, albeit looking largely the same at a glance, all those details were new and the whole fit and finish. So, um, when you sort of list them out like that, there's more, yeah. there's more complete cars designed in the last 10 years than there have been years. So, um, so yeah, it's a, yeah, there's been a lot does keep us busy and you often, you often see that when people first come across Morgan, it's not immediately familiar, but they recognize the shape and then they get under the skin and they realize how flexible the design language is. And when you, when you look at it until last year, when we retired the Aero, the product portfolio is, you know, hugely broad in terms of what these things look like from a crazy three wheeler, like a motorcycle at one end through to a big European touring elaborate aero. And then the classic Morgans in between. It's pretty. I've always thought that the arrows are the most crazy cool looking things. They've just got a lot of that sort of sleek design from old Bentleys and rolls from the past and stuff like that, but in a, in a small sports car, yeah. these concept cars, are they made as like a sort of marketing vision for the future? Yeah, they can be. What's what's? How do they come about? Yeah, they can be. I think, um, and again, a concept vehicle could be for lots of different reasons. You could, 
show a concept that's got real proof of intent and it's almost a validation piece. You know, are we on the right? Are mm. we on the right tracks here? Um, sometimes it would be to as part of a consortium. So Morgan do a lot of work with other technology partners, recognizing you, you know stronger together and you know what you don't know what you don't know. So we often work with other companies to help develop um, new concepts as part of sort of um, industry funds or grants. So we've done projects in the past whereby one partner will bring the batteries, somebody else will bring the motors, somebody else will bring the, the body and the structure, which would be us. Um, so it can just be a sort of a, a knowledge base, if you like, just to learn new things mm. on. Um, in the case of the electric three-wheeler, for us, it was about establishing um, not just would an electric Morgan be accepted, um, how would it look, introducing some design language that we could then draw back on in future, but also starting yeah. to prove out things like how the dealer network would receive electric vehicles. Are they ready to service these cars when customers bring them in? Um, what happens with end of life of batteries? How do we manage that? And sometimes these projects can generate a great deal of learning and knowledge, which is really useful. Since we were talking about it, we might as well dig into it a little bit. Electric three-wheeler. Yeah. I've driven the normal three-wheeler. I had a lot of fun. <laughs> Enjoyed that immensely. Um, I think the one I drove had a, a stage one kit exhaust, something on it. Yeah. And it like, sounded like thunder. Um, now, obviously, that will disappear when it, if, if, if and when an electric car appears um but turning that car electric a lot of the character of that initially obviously it's the shape and the fact it's got one rear wheel and mm -hmm. the size and mm -hmm. all of that was the sort of fun nature of having this kind of mm -hmm. motorbike engine i wouldn't say it was necessarily the best powertrain in the world and i'm sure to work with it was complicated mm -hmm. making a motorbike mm -hmm. that heavy and then sort of running it and stuff what are the sort of things that you have to think about when you start coming up with an electric design. So, so that's really interesting um, angle, actually, really, to talk about um, electric three-wheeler, which kind of might, um, might dovetail us naturally into the sort of future of the three-wheeler, um, where those sort of constraints are quite are quite relevant. But with the decision to electrify the three-wheeler, there is a sort of stage before that, whereby the company first explored electrification of a four-wheeler, which was a little, little known about project, really, although it was public. It, um, didn't have a huge amount of airtime um, mm. because we didn't really declare any intent with it. Very quickly, we we drove the electric four wheeler, and it gained so much weight with the batteries and the particular array that we used of batteries and motors. You get in any Morgan, and you know typically there are a thousand kilograms more or less um, with a big power to weight ratio. Sat very much on the rear axle. They're very lively, exciting, engaging cars to drive, and this four wheeler concept just didn't quite have that character at all. So we thought maybe the three-wheeler was better placed, um, being a naturally lighter car anyway, just over the 500 kilogram mark. We thought it'd be great if yeah. we can kind of maintain that. Um, and we went down the route of developing some bespoke batteries to fit that very compromised packaging space. That later proved to be its downfall, whereby the, the, the supply of these bespoke to us batteries caused us too many challenges in, at a production level. Mm. Um, and I think going forward, we learn a great deal, but we'd probably be looking to source more off the shelf proven powertrain parts, much like we do nowadays with say BMW engines for our, for us. Yeah. But the challenge then for us is exactly like you say, where, where is the, um, is the excitement still there? What would an electric Morgan be like? And I think it was fair to say that all of us were apprehensive about what we were going to end up with. Would it be right for the brand and knowing full well that we needed to be embracing and considering this? Um, we kind of went in with our eyes open just to make sure we were going to get a Morgan still at the end of it. There's not a single person that drove that first prototype that wasn't completely transformed, myself included. It was, <laughs> it was just mega. And I think that was partly because it was still a Morgan. So we still had a wooden frame, which we don't yeah. use just because. We use that because it gives us a lot of flexibility in manufacture. We can tailor new shapes and forms very quickly. It's obviously very sustainable, very light. It's actually very good in crash and managing noise, vibration, and harshness. So we decided to keep that. We still had a handmade coach built body. It still had an infinite spectrums of options and variations. So it was still treated like a Morgan, still built on the line like every other car. The front of the car, the big challenge really was, what do you do without that V-twin? Bear in mind, we were carrying over a lot of the, the, the metal structure, the tubular chassis. So there were some constraints to the overall look of the car. So we did have to address what the front end looked like without chasing it all the way back through the vehicle. For me, it was very important, like any Morgan, to maintain a certain honesty and design. 
So the, mm. the strong graphic on a four-wheeled Morgan, for example, is that big sweeping running board. That's there to act as the wheel arch and to aid ingress and egress to get into your seats. And it's got a functional purpose that makes sense. You can see what it does with your eyes. And for me, the EV3 needed to do the same thing. So we started to look at the requirements of the platform. Um, and one of the things we realized in that tight packaging space, it was important to gauge, um, to obtain some cooling on the front. And this idea of featuring some big cooling fins on the front of the vehicle to help control the temperatures within the powertrain suddenly became mm. the design feature. So on the front of an EV3, you see these big brass conductive cooling fins. Um, yeah, they're quite cool. And that is the purpose of those to, to cool the vehicle. And it also became the aesthetic. Morgans have often had a slightly unusual lighting array in the past. And we quite like gearing character to our faces with the eyes of, of the car. And yeah. so we opted for a monocle in the center. Um, and even that wasn't entirely just a novelty that enabled us to have a headlight positioned at the appropriate height from the ground, which meant that we could take what was the headlights previously and put them really, really low down, which dropped the front face of the car considerably had this almost hot rod, low slung look yeah. on the front of the vehicle. Um, and that was just about being clever with the rule book and complying, but pushing the boundaries a little bit. Um, and as a result, you've got this sort of front end with a lot of purpose. And then you drove the car and there was no insulation. There was no sound deadening. Um, <laughs> and that electric motor, they're not quiet things. You know, they're quiet in a, in a modern production vehicle or, or a gigantic saloon. But in a little car like a three-wheeler with a single skin of aluminium everywhere, they're noisy things. And this thing sounded like a pod racer out of Star Wars. It just <laughs> screamed yeah. at you and you sort of... Um, you get that linear and constant torque delivery. So there's no gear changes. It's just like a bullet. And, you know, you just leave your foot in as long as you can and then let off and the motor's screaming at you. And it was still quite a, a sensory experience. You're still getting pummeled in the face with flies. And you start <laughs> listening to other noises that I guess are apparent in any car, but overwhelmed by the powertrain. Instead of the yeah. exhaust drowning everything out, you start listening to the rumble of the wheels and the tires. Um, you start hearing the wind a lot more around the vehicle and it was, um, yeah, it was a very visceral thing. We built, I think maybe six running prototypes and, and we loved them. We used to fly around Malvern and test centers and we were very genuinely excited about that product. It was a bit of a one that got away from me. It was the one I'd really yeah. love to have seen on the line today and it's paved the way for the future. We, we, we will yeah. be having an electric future at some point, but, um, yeah, no, it was an exciting, exciting project. Do you think the the next electric Morgan could be a three wheeler, or do you think we'll see a hybrid? Hybrid to me doesn't make too much sense in a Morgan. We're keeping we're keeping all options open. I think the one thing we've learned a great deal about how to electrify mm. a Morgan, how to manage that in production safely, how to roll that out as a sort of commercial offering to our network around the world. And we've learned a great deal. We've also learned that you know it would it would be embraced. The EV three was a a big success from a sort of communications point of view, if you like, um, mm. and brand engagement and awareness point of view. So that's all really encouraging. Um, I think the one, the one major thing is when we go forward, we would be taking and working with a technology partner that has proven, uh, proven powertrain architecture out there already. And I think that's safe to say. Um, yeah. And that makes a big difference to us, which, you know, again, we, we do that with BMW at the moment and that's works very well. And, um, so yeah, that's certainly a thing to say. In terms of what platform it lives within, um, we've got a lot of options on that front. And obviously there's only so much I can say at the moment, but there's, <laughs> there's exciting um, product developments coming on all of our platforms, be that the small three-wheeler platform right through to the four-wheeler platform. And we have laid down the foundations for all sorts um, with the introduction of the CX platform under the, under the four wheels, which is our new aluminium structure. That gives us a lot of opportunities yeah. for the future. And we're also looking at the future of three wheeler, which we've just announced recently is, is going to return. So, um, we've got a lot of options on all platforms. Yeah. I think, um, so the new CX platform, is that in, that's in plus six and plus four. That's right. Yeah, that's right. So that was the, the last sort of, well, we've introduced a few projects recently, but that was the, the core bloodline for us, really the traditional shape Morgan. Um, we recognized, um, several years ago now that we needed to start taking a much longer look down the road, the pace at which mm. legislation and emissions and everything's changing around the world. We need to ensure we are future-proofed and the outgoing steel ladder frame chassis was starting to limit us in terms of options for powertrains, 
there's a general perception of sort of quality and fit and finish and much higher expectations of cars, especially in the price brackets we're operating in to be sustainable that needed to be addressed. And it really was a kind of blank canvas. Let's start again with the core product. Yeah. What we actually did um, was start with the narrow bodied car, which is our plus four. And that was to, that was in recognition that um, we need to continue building small, sweet sports cars. You know, everything else is growing yeah. so quickly. And we kind of stamped off it and said, no, let's keep these things small and light and nimble. Um, and the challenge was to package a modern, two different modern BMW powertrains, the, the B48 and the B58, the inline four and six cylinder engines yeah. with um, turbochargers and, you know, pretty sizable cooling packs as a result. These are hot running engines. So keeping them cool is a, is a big challenge. We were also set the challenge to cater for a greater percentile range, ergonomic percentile range. So as many right, shapes yeah. and sizes of people as possible um, with greater comfort, but better build quality. So squeeze a lot more in the same space and do it better than four basically <laughs> was the challenge. Um, and so we started with the plus four. So we developed the CX platform, which is just marketing jargon for 110 because it was in our 110th year that we, we yeah. <laughs> It was actually called something completely different during development, but it's um, so yeah. The CX platform was catered for the smaller, narrow body car, which meant that when we introduced the plus six, which we actually announced first, everything like the seating positions was very inboard, even the corner package. So, where the wheels are, we knew we wanted a modern dual wishbone setup, but we also knew we couldn't get rid of the wire wheel on a plus four, and the way a wire wheel is laced up naturally means you're a hugely negative offset because the wheel needs to okay. strengthen itself by, you know, um, lacing the spokes from the front to the rear. So it's a very deep wheel. So by designing a platform and a corner package that catered for that very deep wheel meant that when we introduced an alloy wheel on the plus six, we got a very nice, good looking, deep alloy wheel. Yeah. And where that's sort of paid off is where you see a lot of classic looking retro mods. And you see a lot of these resto mods at the moment on modern running gear. And they all have awful wheels that aren't particularly classic looking because they've got modern yeah, brake yeah. packages really filling the wheels. And that's what always looks a bit off about them. Um, so we sort of played into our own court on that one by starting out with a plus four, squeezing everything in yeah. that. And then when we did the plus six, we had a lot more space to play with on the sides of the car. That's also then got its benefit in terms of what else might live on that chassis. So you can imagine with redundant space around the outside of the vehicle or the center of gravity right towards the center line, we've got a lot of space to put undercut and full bodied interest into the side of the cars too. So the CX platform was really quite joined up in that sense. We took a much longer view down the road and thought about all the different powertrain platforms and body styles that could live on top of that. So, um, so yeah, that's quite been quite an exciting and big chapter in our, in our books really. And our plus four and yeah. plus sixes have, have been received really well. They're, they're, our, um, yeah, they're our backbone, really, like I say, the bread and butter of Morgan. and Both very exciting cars for different reasons. Yeah, I remember I came down and drove the plus six after, I can't remember how long after it had come out, but not too much longer. And I, at the time, had a, an M2. Okay. So a very similar mm -hmm. powertrain. Mm-hmm. And I was amazed at driving the plus six back to back yeah. with my M2. I think I drove down in my M2 yeah. and then drove the plus six. And it's completely transformed in that car. Like it, it, it seems completely bonkers yeah. in the plus six. Whereas the M2, you're like, yeah, this is kind of like quick yeah. car. Like not slow, but quick. Whereas the plus six, you're just getting, you, it kind of felt a bit like that kind of 911 Turbo S sucked down the road you obviously your head's out and you're going <laughs> yeah, that's it. all that that craziness but then um i had the plus four for a bit uh last year i think and i really really like the plus four i don't and it's it's not common for me to like the lower down mm. or the sort of smaller mm. size car in a range because you're generally drawn towards the bigger one yeah but there were, i don't know what there is what it is about that car whether it was the fact it was a manual yeah. and the plus six at the time is it, can you have a manual plus no, six yet? No, not yet not yet um and i think that that just sort of connected but also being in a smaller car when you start going down small roads and stuff is just it's just much not it's like an easier experience 
neither of them are massive yeah. but yeah, no, yeah. I, I very much enjoyed driving yeah, the no, bus four i think it was a yeah a that's, wicked that's, re- thing. that's really interesting every i mean going back a few years pre-cx the classic range of morgans looked much more alike and um mm. there was very little in the body size and it was all in the powertrain really people used to say then they are they look very much like the same car but they are such variation in the types of car and how you use them just because of that powertrain one of my personal yeah. favorites was the little 1600 um naturally aspirated mazda mx5 gearbox uh little 44 that we did and the car weighed like 800 mm. kilograms it had sliding pillar suspension live rear axle um and it was just all gears little 1600 very little power but um it was a Sigma engine, I believe, which was probably originally designed by Yamaha. And naturally, it was quite a revvy engine. So it used to really live in the, yeah. live in the revs all the time. You could really stand on the pedals and drive it hard and, and it not be scary. Um, and it was just so little and nimble. It wouldn't go around a corner particularly fast, but you'd have so much fun sort of playing with it and wood, with a wooden rim steering wheel, just sort of feeding it and pointing it. And very engaging car to drive. And that was, that was the entry-level Morgan. That was the, the cheapest car that we did. Um, yeah. it, was, it was phenomenal fun. Um, but then you get in a plus eight V8, the N62 engine car, um, cause maybe you would drive into Europe for a weekend or for an event, um, or go away with a partner a bit further afield and, you know, just eating the miles with that soundtrack of the V8, um, mm. quite a big lazy V8, but it was just great for just wafting powerfully with that sense of that sense of power. And it was a completely different experience to the 4-4. Um, but visually quite similar looking cars. And I think the plus four and yeah. the plus six are very similar. That for a sort of outright, really, you know, give yourself a, an intense experience, there's nothing quite like standing on a plus six accelerator pedal and just seeing what happens. Uh, you're sat right on that axle, like you say, driving yeah. M2s and things that are very sort of comparable powertrains and fast, phenomenal cars. Um, you do get a much heightened sense of that power when you're sat directly on the rear axle with just a single skin of aluminium between you and the road and it's um yeah quite an exciting thing to drive but then similarly a plus four is just a cracking all-round car great fun for just barreling around the countryside and and uh, having a lot of fun in so people are aware of Morgan, but when you visit the factory and you you go on a factory tour and you see how they're made and that you know this isn't machinery everywhere and big stamping tools it's <laughs> it's guys with their toolbox using their hands and banging the panels into shape and measuring and lining things up by eye and you see the craft and then you go and drive one and there's not many things that drive like a morgan um good or bad yeah it's, <laughs> it's, 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 uh, <laughs> it's uh, it is a very different very experience different. if you're used to driving yeah whatever modern german stuff yeah. or italian or whatever you go drive a morgan yeah. and you can't like you said you can't on paper read what the experience is going to be like wrong. you yeah, go yeah. oh it's x number of horsepower or whatever if you start to look at the weight you might get a bit of an idea of yeah. how that might affect yeah. your horsepower and then yeah, like you said, you go do a tour around the factory and it's just completely unlike in, in a, a really cool place, especially I think if you're from another country, it's like the coolest place on earth because it's England and it's so English. Yeah. But you see everyone, you know, building the stuff and using wood and hand stamping the bonnets and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. I had a little go at that when I when Oh, I came brilliant. Nice one. I think, yeah. <laughs> I think they threw that metal in the bin. Um, <laughs> and then, yeah, take it for a drive. It is definitely a... It's a it's a it's a very different experience, and you can't. No, that, that that's there it. is nothing. Yeah, there's nothing else modern that, that, that you could buy new yeah. that is similar in any way, yeah. shape, or form. And that's it. And that is it. And I think that's what we've always got an eye on, whether it's a electric car or a or a, you know a new IC car. We've always just got an eye on: is it ticking those boxes? Is it a small, sweet British sports car that offers an experience unlike anything else? Morgan DNA, you know, hasn't got those friend, a friendly face. Morgans aren't a pretentious or yeah. an aggressive car. You see them and it makes you want to smile. They're not, you know, there's no, there's no sort of aggression about what a Morgan looks like. It is quite honest and, and friendly and approachable. Um, and has it got those ingredients? Is it hand built? Is it crafted uniquely to you? Is it built here in England? And if you take those ingredients, you can actually challenge what these things look like and how they get to live that experience quite a lot. We just announced a project in recent weeks called the CXT, which is a an off-road rally car, basically, if you like, um, which is 
again, turned a few heads. People just didn't see it coming, much like the electric three-wheeler. They've just gone, wow, what's this? But you start reading into it and you realize there is a lot of story and a lot of authenticity and a lot of integrity in the approach. And actually, the Morgan brand can be quite flexible. Can you explain to the audience what is what is the CXT? <laughs> so the so CXT is one that didn't get away. CXT is an idea that we thought about and played around with. I mean, look, we're all designers, right? So there's a, there's a team of us, eight of us now, and we are constantly uh, just creating things for, you know, for the sake of creating and sketching all sorts <laughs> of different ideas. And many years ago, we drew a Morgan inspired by our history of endurance trialing. So trialing in the UK was, was quite a big thing in the sort of early mid-century, whereby manufacturers would prove out the durability of their cars by putting them through an endurance trial, typically off-road, like a rally, point-to-point type exercises, rutted, muddy yeah. lanes, climbing up hills, various different disciplines, technical driving. And Morgans were always really good at this. Skinny tires cut through the mud. They're very lightweight, so they bounced around. And even today, a lot of the sort of classic racing clubs still bounce around in Morgans and fields. I think they call it bouncing. This idea of what would a modern day Morgan trailer look like was something we always thought was quite cool. Several years ago, when sort of Ariel were making noises about Nomad and stuff, we were sort of drawing, yeah. we were drawing, you know, the Morgan equivalents. And they, they took a lot of different guises on. And then when we started drawing CX, recognizing that at a glance, the CX cars look largely like the outgoing traditional steel ladder frame cars, we thought, how could we bring attention to the fact it's got this radical new chassis underneath the car? So we thought, yeah. oh, wouldn't it be cool if we entered a CX car into one of these endurance rallies? So we started thinking, okay, what if we just lifted the ride height a bit and we stuck some knobbly tires on it? And we just, we spent a few days um, much to the dislike of everyone else who thought we should have been <laughs> focusing on the actual projects. Um, we spent a few days just drawing what these things might look like. We stuck them on the wall, didn't think much more of it. Yeah. And then Andrea Bonomi, who is um, uh, the sort of uh, principal at the Invest Industrial Group that are now our, sort of, um, our owners, if you like, they mm-hmm. visited one day, as they often do, just for a walk around, see what's going on. And they saw this sketch on the wall and they went, wow. That'd be cool. Let's do that. <laughs> and then they were kind of walked out and straight after. And we kind of looked at each other and went, oh, do you reckon they're serious? No, nah, they won't be serious. <laughs> and sure enough, the following Saturday morning, I got a call from Steve, our CEO. And he went, I think we've set something up. And we came in and Andrea Benoni was there. He was very excited about everything. And he'd uh, brought with him uh, an organization called Rally Raid UK, who are, yeah. um, I mean, fantastic experience with Dakar rally racing. They, I don't think they've ever won a Dakar rally because you don't unless you're spending seven figures, but they, um, they've they never not finished one. And that was quite an acclaim in okay. sort of 20-something Dakars. You know, they know what they're doing. Um, they've got a huge amount of Dakar experience between them. Um, and they know exactly what it takes to set up a car for endurance driving. We were never going to enter a Dakar, the sort of regulations around approach angles and viewing angles and plastic bodies and fuel capacity meant that the car just wouldn't have been a Morgan. It would have been a badge on a fiberglass body, but we could use their knowledge and experience to essentially take one of these cars and navigate it through a classic Dakar route. So the idea was this car needs to be able to finish a Dakar route. And that was the break. Okay. So working hand in hand with those guys, we essentially pushed this project along and started turning it into a reality. Um, And it was just mega every step of the way. They were taking very much a, a form follows function approach. And we were there very much wanting to keep an eye on this thing, maintaining its identity as a Morgan. And right, it was amazing, yeah. really. There was so many little nuances we wanted to, we wanted to make sure we didn't grow the overall width of the vehicle. And the first thing those guys wanted to do was grow the width of the vehicle, stick some huge tires, go outboard, massive sort of footprint, but we wanted to keep it narrow. So we, we did a lot of work on the corner packages to bring them inboard. We actually ended up using a plus six corner package and absorbing some of that negative offset we talked about earlier. So we did end up with quite a flat yeah. wheel, but that gave us the articulation without the penalty of going big on the size of the car. So um, chunky, it's no yeah, bigger yeah. than a plus four in terms of width, but um, but sits significantly higher. Um, it's got 240 millimeters of suspension travel, some EXTC really, really quality dampers in each corner, loads of underbody protection, big thick steel shielding. 
and then this huge exoskeleton that's designed to carry pelly cases and toolkits and snatch ropes and everything you could possibly need to get you out of a sand dune. Um, and then it's got an electronic rear differential, um, which does all sorts of very clever things with the, the diff locks and various different settings, which essentially means it will get you out of a stuck situation or you can go sideways around a corner with very little effort if you decide <laughs> to turn it on on the road. Um, so it's just got all of this, all of this sort of mechanical wizardry and modifications. But fundamentally, it's a B48 manual engine, untouched in terms of its power delivery, um, yeah. inside a CX chassis, which hasn't had anything done to it to stiffen the thing up. It's a really cool looking thing. It's got on one side, it's got this what what just looks like a leather bag, but it's not a leather bag, is it? That's right. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, we. We had to manage all sorts of things like in, in the heat and temperature, should we go and do a classic rally raid? Um, we've got to ensure that we can get these things kept cool and be sucking in enough volume of air without just pulling dust in. So inside one of those bags is a gigantic sort of desert spec air filter that would still breathe if you were to bury it in sand. Um, and on the <laughs> other side is a load of extra recovery equipment. But like you say, they're designed to look like panniers. So, yeah, like I said, yeah. on paper, we'd sketched all this stuff out and, you know, it, it, was, it looked mega. It looked like just a dream come true, but we hadn't actually seen it delivered until a few months mm. into the project. Um, and there was always that sort of apprehension of would, would this car be any good? Um, and so we turned up one day in a, to see a mule car, which was kind of a basic Morgan. It was an old prototype vehicle that had had all the, uh, the running gear updated, but visually didn't look much different. Yeah, just to do this shakedown exercise. And um, I've been out of my time here at Morgan, naturally. I've been out in, in a lot of cars, a lot of race circuits, been out with a few pro drivers. I'm not a nervous kind of passenger. I'm quite trusting of people I'm with if I, if I know they're experienced. And, you know, I've, I've had some fast rides in Morgans. Um, and I've never really felt too uncomfortable. Um, I was taken out by a sort of pro Dakar driver in this first Morgan. And I was sat in this car thinking, I don't need to be here, man. I've got kids. So I, I've got to get out of this car. This is too much. And it was just bonkers. And you could tell the drivers that were there on this first shakedown day, they'd probably almost been given a bit of a pep talk, you know, whatever you do, make sure the Borgen boys are happy to say, say the right stuff. And these guys were like, we don't need to make this up. This is a, this is a seriously good fun car. You know, it's not what these guys are used to. They're used to these ridiculous yeah. space frame, 800 brake horsepower things. Um, but as far as a road car goes, because that's what this is. This is a car built for overland adventure. It's not trying to be a Dakar car or, yeah. you know, a rally car. It's a, it's an overland vehicle, really. But um, it's really good. It was really sort of eye-opening. And then straight away there, we came away from that shakedown day, and this is going to be exciting. This is going to be a real cool thing. But um, oh, it, was just, it was just nuts. We came off this. At one point, the chap that I was with was just driving towards the edge of this cliff in Wales, and I'm saying, I was just making sure he was paying attention, really, and he just dropped off this thing. And halfway down this rocky slope that he was just sliding down was a boulder that was about 16 inches across. And uh, I was like, that was it. From what it lasted, that would be game over then. And he just went through this <laughs> thing, and it just explodes like dust, and just car just carried on. It's bonkers. It's, it's, it was sort of surreal, really. But yeah, a lot of fun. Really exciting project. Sounds pretty fun. How many are you going to make? How many are you making? We're building eight of those. Um, eight of those, which includes a sort of um, a validation vehicle for us. Um, but um, predominantly, they're going to six customers um, who have all got very excited about that and invested in the invested in the project. So, so and how does that work from start to finish? So you've had you had some investors walking around going, "This is that mm, that looks cool. Let's do that," mm -hmm. and then. Hmm, okay can we do that talk to some people do some deals mm -hmm. whatever mm -hmm. is at that point or a, cu a couple of customers other customers contacted and said are you interested in this yeah or sure. do you then go let's do it and then find a customer yeah sure so it can um it can be done it can be, can be done in different ways i think we don't we don't we don't love announcing a car to the world that's already pre-sold so we did hold a couple back because it's nice to mm. nice to give people the opportunity having seen it publicly um but we do also have a lot of people as as with anyone i guess that you know people in slightly more inside the tent than others that we know would be interested in, in being a part of something in particular. Um, yeah. And, you know, even the, 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 Italian, the Italians that um, we've worked with and a lot of their friends were interested in this as well. So they've gone in all different directions, actually. Some to Scotland, some into Europe, some, 
it's them all over actually but um everyone's taken a slightly different approach we were quite keen that these weren't sort of seven identical cars morgan don't really mm. do sort of limited editions every car is a a one-off rather than a one-of if that makes sense when we do these limited yeah. editions so um so yeah everyone's slightly different some of them are going to end up with bike racks on them one guy wants to use his to go to the coast and paddleboard so he'll have some paddle boards on the side yeah. somebody else has got these super cool lift foils again water sports wants to go down to the coast yeah, and yeah, use yeah. these sort of powered lift foils and he's going to use it to carry those on the roof rack i think somebody's having a roof tent um uh, <laughs> there was one talk of one having roo bars and roof boxes and things for doing like australian outback okay. driving and yeah yeah, every, everyone's <laughs> going to be a little bit different, a little bit special. But that's, and they're all, it sounds like they're all going to get used. I would imagine so, yeah. And they certainly can be. That was oh. kind of the brief. It can't just all be all, um, all show and no go. They've got to, they've got to work. So. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Well, no, it's a pretty cool, pretty cool project, that. I, I, thumbs up from yeah. here. I, I love all kind of cars that have been made a bit more off-roady. Yeah even if they actually never go off road is they're kind of just fun anyway cuz the the weight moves around a bit more and they yeah. they're just designed to be a bit more silly yeah and to, it's quite good fun we don't, we don't really go with the flow here at morgan if it, feel, if it feels <laughs> right and it feels like a morgan then you know we're we're happy to sort of approach it and do it with the confidence that it will work um and yeah there was no sort of large committees or focus groups or you know big mass decision making with this this was just a bunch of really passionate automotive guys that <laughs> were like right how do we how do we do this so it looks good feels like a morgan and actually works and it's just the knowledge of the engineering and design teams coming together and and just enjoying it really and that's that's the nice thing i like about morgan i think it's what's kept me here for so long it's the very um it's a massive cliche isn't it but it's a very sort of passionate place to work everyone's really enjoys what they do yeah that's cool. And that, how long does that project take from start to finish? Um, not long enough, that one. That was really quick. Um, <laughs> that was probably a year. Okay. That doesn't feel, that feels like a long time, but not a long time. Yeah, it's not really a long time in the automotive world. I mean, um, we, 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 are, we do have the ability at Morgan to be very agile. We're, we all work in one room, for example. So just where I'm sat now, I can't, I can't turn my camera around because of the uh, what's on the walls. But um <laughs> essentially there's no design studio and then down the corridor the engineering room and then down the corridor the electrical bit or the legal yeah. offices yeah. we're all just sat in one room so i am um, you know you work directly alongside the engineers so you kind of straight away even when you're doing the very first sketches you'll have the approvals guy leaning over your shoulder saying you can't do that it's not gonna you're not gonna yeah. comply or the headlight needs to be higher and that's how it was it sounds like a constraint that sort of stuff means that you you never write first time because there's no such thing. You always have to go for a prototype, yeah. but you're much closer to the mark very early on. And even the decision to move a headlight on the front of a car is the difference between a sort of drop nose 250 short wheelbase and a, and a yeah. saloon car. You know, that makes a huge difference <laughs> just the height of a headlight. So if you, if you can risk mitigate a lot of the feasibility, the engineering and the legislation right from the off, that yeah. saves a lot of time. So we're very, very lean. We also don't need to wait for prototype parts to be shipped in. We can go and ask the craftsmen on the shop floor who are all very, you know, capable of building things without drawings and definition. Yeah. And they can just prototype stuff for us, which really helps. Um, and there's a lot of knowledge in the room. So, um, yeah, we're able to be quite agile and quite lean. But um, we yeah, still are very ambitious. That's cool. We have to be responsive, really. So we're, we're ambitious. What are the sort of regulations that are the hardest to sort of design around deal with as someone that maybe mm. likes aesthetic looking cars mm. what's the what are the, the ones at the moment that are the tricky a lot of the powertrain stuff you know engines are running hotter and hotter they need more space to breathe there's more electronic wizardry and computers and sensors and plugs and cooling packs are getting bigger and bigger and there's a reason that you know the new one series is as big as an old three series. You know they, the cars they're needing to grow just to fit all this stuff in. Yet we're yeah. sort of standing there, stamping our feet, refusing to. So it's <laughs> it's it is it's it's the packaging exercises, managing the cooling and the thermal dynamics and the electric design that goes into these cars nowadays. It's everything is powered by laptop. Being an electrical engineer is probably more important if not as important as being a mechanical engineer nowadays in the car world it's um everything is a computer 
driven system. And so that's that's the biggest learning curve for us, catering for all that technology whilst keeping an eye on, you know, ensuring we're we're keeping the sort of mechanical attributes as well. There's an analog interface to a Morgan, which is harder and harder to maintain with new technology. Um, but for us, it's important. It's that knowing you're operating a machine, which is one of the bigger deals yeah. of driving a Morgan. Um, so, yeah, that's one of the big challenges. The other one, I guess, would probably be legislation. Um, everything from yeah. viewing angles and lighting angles and soft radiuses on things. And it's um, it's increasingly important. Not that it's ever not been important, but it's, it's, it's increasingly stringent, the amount of legality you need to know. And you almost need to know the rule book inside out before you put pen to paper. Where, where do my lights yeah. have to be? What are my vision angles like for my mirrors? How high does my H point have to be um, from the road? And stuff like that just completely alters the fundamentals, the proportions of a car. So, you um, yeah, you have to be one step ahead of all of that sort of stuff. If you're sketching a new design or something, do you put those in, in first yeah. or do you go sketch and then, oh, how long? So, yeah, I need that's to you have to put them in this. very early on. And I guess... I guess our job really is to be the sort of conductors. You've got all these different instruments playing and it's, it's making sure everything's considered and everything's heard, but you haven't lost the track of keeping an exciting product there at its core. Um, yeah. And we, we approach it quite differently. So there's different types of industrial designers. I'm a, I get very excited about the delivery bit. For me, if the sketch of a car just lives on a piece of paper, it's a, it's a piece of art. It's wonderful to see and shows great imagination, but I need to touch it and feel it. I get I get really excited yeah. when these sketches leave the paper and I like solving the problems with the engineering. I'm a bit competitive. I like winning battles with engineering when they say <laughs> we can't do this. I'm like, nah, we can. And I like um, <laughs> I like I, I like getting involved with the technical side too. I like seeing the car being delivered. I've got designers yeah. in my team, really talented team. Really, really lucky to work with the guys that I do. Um, and some of the chaps are very much blue spark sky. They're, they're 10 years ahead in terms of what's coming up next and trend analysis. They've got an encyclopedic knowledge of cars going backwards and they've got a real vision for what these things look like. And there's different types of designers and you need all of it. You need one guy to yeah. be going completely blue sky because that's where the fresh ideas appear. And then you need other guys right. that are really honed in on delivering that. And at Morgan, we've always tried to make sure we've got a good mix of those designers here because... You can become uninteresting if you design it just perfectly, all things considered from the outset, and you can go too far yeah. the other way and make something unfeasible, which is inefficient. So, yeah. I, on a very small level of designing stuff and it being impossible to make, I did design at, um, at school A level, yeah. and then I studied mechanical engineering for a couple of years. And the doing the design part, which was like a lot of manufacturing and making stuff yeah. and designing it and whatever the people that had done that and then went into engineering came at projects from a completely different angle to the people that had gone from some some other angle into the engineering. And it would be, you had to, I think one of the things you had to make it a machine that would like, you press a button and it pops out a cup. Like it's like a cup dispenser type thing. And, and all the people that had done design were like, let's just do a box and then let's work out the stuff inside. Like, they, let's give ourselves as much space in an easiest way of constructing it. And then the people that hadn't would be like, let's make a curved diamond shaped object <laughs> that it. sits on its end. And you're like, what the fuck? Yeah, <laughs> We're never going to be able to make it. That's it. That's it. And I love, and I love that. <laughs> actually, I love that. I'm particularly lucky here, actually. Our, um, our, our chief engineer of Morgan, who's uh, not long in been that position, actually, he was previously an homologation engineer. So he was coming from the legislation. It must comply bit. So, we worked together very yeah. heavily then because the first guy you speak to in the office is the guy that is going to basically test and approve the car because if he can't get it mm. past the final line, then there's no point starting. The engineering is almost the sandwich bit in the middle. Um, so I worked closely with him before, but he's now in his chief engineering position and we've been school, like since, for instance, school. Um, and that's yeah. great because we can, we can sort of publicly and openly argue with each other. And that's important to yeah. be able to do that. You need to be able to really... <laughs> fight your corner and also respect where each other's coming from um and yeah. that's that's the only way you get a brilliant product which is really well de- really well designed but that eye on form and function has really been maintained too and if you get that right you get a really yeah. interesting product but um i love that bit that's the that's the fun bit of design yeah. for me get that blend yeah. now morgan's because they've got this sort of classic image one of the things uh, I, I remember when i had the plus four driving it around for ages and then i was like I feel like this car has a stereo. I can't work this out. 
And then I looked around, I was like, no, there's definitely like little holes in the door. There's speakers in here. <laughs> I don't understand. There's no screen. What the hell? And then I eventually worked out that you could pair your phone via Bluetooth yeah. and use the stereo. Yeah. Um, that sort of thing. I mean, I love that yeah. because it's simple yeah. and gives you exactly what you need. Yeah. Um, but moving forward all this sort of software and engines and they all have different modes and whatnot yeah. is that trickier to sort of stay with that classic look whilst that's right yeah you, you, having screens or not you've having absolutely screens. hit it on the head there it's it's sort of working out what your key values are but also looking forward and making sure you're embracing everything that needs to be embraced in a clever way um at the moment, we spend as long obsessing about making sure that when it looks like wood, it is wood. And if there's a walnut dashboard, that we're getting the perfect amount of grain figuring and and the, the finish of that wood is perfect, like a beautiful shotgun stock. And that's the bit you are looking at and engaging with. When you hit a switch, mm. it's a mechanical switch. You feel it. It's tactile. It's cold to the yeah. touch. And they're the bits for us that you don't get in a modern vehicle there's a lot of plastic and it's warm and soft and and friendly and we want that engaging mechanical tactile bit and we want that to be the bit that we you engage with but you can't take an eye off the fact that people do want to stay connected and they do want to listen to what they want to listen to and it's about having that technology but the bluetooth interface and the screen shouldn't be what you see for us an lcd screen you see them every day they've got a purpose but they're not beautiful and what we want is something beautiful that is that gives you a an escape from that technology a little bit. Um, yeah. So we try to package the technology. We use the term a lot here, relevant technology. We try to ensure what is relevant is there and is available and works well, but it isn't the focus um, in mm. a lot of in a lot of instances. Um, that's not yeah, to, think- that's not to say as as times change and like an electric vehicles in particular, you've got to display a lot more information that can't be done on a cable actuated Smith's clock. You just can't, yeah. you just can't do it. You need to have LCD interfaces. So then we start looking at things like interesting typography and fonts and colors. When we did the EV3, we thought, wouldn't it be cool to bring back a sort of a monochrome fisheye lens like you'd have from a 1950s projector TV where the glass is all rounded off and it, yeah. you know, it displays it in a very sort of authentically classic way, which is just a little bit more interesting to engage with than a 4K screen. Yeah. So it's just about adding interest and it's that experience again. How can you, how can you do it in such a way where it offers value and quality and it isn't just there because the thing the design elements on a car that in the last when i can't remember when, it, when this car came out but that i looked at and went that's a smart long term that's a smart option is the bentley continental flipping like spinning yeah. display that's so it. that you can have it just on your clocks or just bare wood and then you can have the display that's if you it. want because these displays look old after about five minutes that's it yeah that, that i think that's brilliant yeah that's a really good example that's a, that's a great way bentley to have that have that eye for where the value is is contained Mm. and the relevant technology one thing with the displays on and i can't remember if it was like this on the plus four but it was on the plus six if you wear polarizing sunglasses yeah you can't read the speedo yeah yeah no we dropped the ball there so we uh, (laughs) have that's something (laughs) we've addressed and are addressing um we have we have addressed the next generation screens there um and i think you know ultimately we we aren't a sort of 500 strong engineering team with the backing of the VAG yeah. group. We are 30 enthusiastic blokes in Malvern at the bottom of the hill. And, you know, we are, <laughs> we are sort of, I wouldn't say doing our best because I think everyone does a brilliant job. It's what I, what I think a lot of the character of these cars is born from the circumstance in which they're created. And I think the yeah. values you get from having a small passionate team of people delivering something completely unique, um, sure there are compromises too and there are things that you know we, we don't deliver on and it's all lessons learned and we move forward and try and embrace it but you're right lcd screens we're, we're learning as we go it's a new technology for us <laughs> just bear with us <laughs> but, um, what else i noticed the um the plus six also had a seat it's, you can have a different seat now um you can yeah we have that was another one that we've um we've walked forward so i mean both of those items they 
they reflect a new way of thinking as well, where whereby in the past we'd be sort of right or wrong, we'd be all invested in the in the closest crocodile. So it'd be all about the next era, we'd be focusing on that. Yeah. And then it'd be on to the next product. And perhaps we've been in the past a little guilty of not keeping an eye on continual product refreshment on all of our model lines. Mm. Um, which is something that is important to do, um, especially today. So we now are visiting all of our core products with model year revisions in a much more frequent sort of manner now. So every year on year, we're keeping an eye on developing new features, new accessories, new options, and new bits for all of our cars, just to add that continued improvement. So we did a good, um, a big reappraisal of the seating and CX vehicles, and added a lot more adjustment and and comfort options in them. We've just recently visited the whole seal package. And whilst rubber sealing on a car sounds like something, it's, it's fairly <laughs> straightforward. Managing water at high speed is not an easy thing to do without yeah. a lot of expensive tooling. If you imagine a seal that goes all the way around a car door, that's made in a big injection mold tool that would be as big as the door. So you can be spending a quarter yeah. of a million quid on some of these tooling for these things like these seals. And when you're making you know, 800 cars a year, that's quite a hard thing to amortize. So they're the sort of challenges yeah. that we face. Um, so yeah, we've just looked at a, a complete new seal package for the hood just to, um, I mean, I like the odd drip of water in my eye with the roof up. I think it adds character. <laughs> but, you know, we've, we've addressed that um, hood functionality, some of the infotainment options, seats. We're just constantly sort of re revisiting and revising the offering. And actually, we'll be looking at some quite significant updates on CX cars in the next sort of two years. Um, so, yeah, there's sort of constant constant revision of those things. That's good. That's yeah. good. Because, like, I remember, you know, you drive something and you're like, I've noticed this. And or maybe I'm the first person to notice this. Yeah. Maybe I'm the 50th person I've noticed it. And you're like, I generally try not to, like, trash anyone or whatever, but just be like, this is a thing you may not have thought yeah. of but it's really and, and annoying and you know what that is that that sort of feedback is the most valuable thing and we we do spend quite a lot of time at morgan on the on the front line so we don't staff our events with events staff we tend to you know work the shows ourselves we build the show stands yeah. ourselves we design them we go there and man them and it's great meeting people firsthand and what you might think is the most important thing actually you hadn't you hadn't thought of it from a different point of view so that's really valuable all of that sort of feedback and we we take that quite seriously um at morgan yeah. the lcd screen that's cool. we were kind of um we kind of said a standard i think it just needs to be off let's just not display anything it's almost like we didn't really want to embrace yeah. it <laughs> just let, let's make it black and if it needs to show you something it then just shows you something in the corner we we kind of a, yeah. even then we're a bit reluctant to embrace it the next generation will actually be on permanently and is, is designed in a little bit more um so yeah. we're, we're slowly walking these things forward it's getting there. It's, it's getting, getting there. there. <laughs> cool. <laughs> I must say, every, no, time, I... every time I get into Morgan, being around them so often, my mind instantly goes to what I want to change or what I dislike or what could have been better because it's our job to be critical um, and, and try and move things yeah, forward. If you're not moving yeah, forward, exactly. and that is literally your job, yeah, it's literally just, to design just to design and improve this stuff. So, <laughs> so, yeah, and I get in every time I take a Morgan, whether it's just to go home or, you know, if I pick my son up from school or, you know, go away for a weekend. And if I take a Morgan, I start my time in the car looking at all those bits and being annoyed by it. Mm. And then <laughs> I always, and still today, begrudgingly hand the keys back when I get back to the factory and I'm like, oh, enjoying that i don't want to get back in my land rover now that's kind of a, it was a nice place to be yeah. and you know <laughs> they do they do sort of they do sort of win you over morgan's but. yeah i i really like i enjoyed driving the plus six but i enjoyed driving the plus four a lot yeah. more i don't know why yeah, whether it was like yeah. more time and yeah yeah that, that's it i had whatever recently I spent, it was a lovely little car recently i spent quite a bit of time in the plus six actually i am um, i I came into work on the on the motorbike one day, and then it was raining, and decided I didn't want to go home on it. And I kind of had a, I kind of had a car in the car or a vehicle in the wrong place, so I ended up buying yeah. cars quite a lot um, for a, quite a period of time. And I ended up being in a couple of different plus sixes. And a plus six, you are very very aware of that power. You're very aware that this car, mm. you really have to respect it. No traction control, no driver aids. It's just down to your ability. Um, and quite often my ambitions outweigh my abilities and, you know, and, um, <laughs> and, I, uh, and yeah, so you sort of, you are sort of not, you're not second guessing them, but you're kind of very aware of its, of its power. Um, 
But after a couple of weeks, when you really start to understand the car and where its limits are, there's a remarkable fun to be had in a plus six, actually. And I've sort of, you know, I was a big fan of the plus four manuals too, but, you know, the plus six is a, it's quite a machine to spend some time with. Yeah, different, different, mm, very different, different yeah, beast. Exactly. Right. Well, I normally wrap these up with five questions. Okay. Are you ready? I've got no idea what these are going to be, so we'll see how we... Uh... <laughs> That's good. Do you have a most memorable driving trip or journey? Most memorable driving trip or journey? Oh, I've got a few memorable trips or journeys. Um, I must admit, actually, one of the recent ones that's been super enjoyable and will always stick in my mind was at the beginning of the pandemic, we were due to launch the Plus Four into at the Geneva Motor Show. And the lorries had gone out, the show stand had gone out, and me and uh, my right-hand man, a chap called Mike Smith, who does all of our videography and, and video media work here, were due to fly out, finally dress of the show stand, and get ready to open the show at Geneva with the new Plus Fours. We'd only built two cars uh, to show at the time. <clears throat> and that was, I don't know, like the Saturday before the show was due to start, on the Wednesday, and we were going to unveil the Plus Four, and... I got a phone call from Steve Morris, our CEO, and when Geneva's just been cancelled, I opened my phone, sure enough, Geneva Merch Show cancelled. And I was like, oh, cock, what are we are going to do now? And then um, Steve continued to say, but we need the cars back. So get on the plane anyway and go and get the cars back. So we had to fly to outside of Geneva where we met the lorry driver before he crossed the border into Switzerland. So we didn't have too much of an issue with a car name. So we ended up walking around rural middle of nowhere, trying to find this lorry and a lay-by. <laughs> we jumped in a plus four, stuck some trade plates on it, gave it a quick once over and a spanner check because this car wasn't intended to be driven. It was, you know, a show yeah. car. So we had to put some fluids in it and just sort the whole thing out. And then we drove from um, just outside of Geneva into Geneva then. Um, once it was come off the lorry, stopped in the hotel we would have been at, which was surreal being there sort of 16 hours later than planned. And we had the yeah. booking already. And then we drove back and we decided to do no major roads, do it all on B roads and film the entire journey. And luckily I was with our videographer. So we had like a GoPro yeah. and a little camera and we documented the whole thing. We decided to do it with the roof down all the way. Um, chickened out halfway through when we were getting really icy and wet and put the roof up halfway through but that was mega and we did a big route all through everywhere we went all around the outside of france and amazing little b roads and obscure mountain roads and met a load of interesting people along the way and just had a, a completely spontaneous road trip in this brand new brand really new good. car that no one had seen nobody obviously recognized it was yeah. a brand new car because it was a morgan so we got away with that one but, um <laughs> you know we uh we yeah we had this awesome journey back uh, rolled into the factory cleaned the car up stuck a suit on and then had a load of friends and family that had been invited to the factory and some and some press and we unveiled the car and it was you know it was a bit like um the famous run back from uh with the e-type to the to the motor show to get the drive um yeah but yeah no it was a it was a on a smaller scale it was a pretty epic little road trip completely unplanned very cool oh, that sounds so yeah that, that, sounds that was the good. start of our pandemic Sorry, long answer to a quick fire question. <laughs> yeah. No, it's it was good. If you can only drive one car for the rest of your life and you're allowed a five hundred pound banger, whatever on the side. So you're technically allowed two cars. And you're allowed a five hundred pound banger on the side. You're allowed a five hundred pound banger on the side and then one car. Oh, and it can be any value. Crikey. Very difficult. So my five hundred banger is gonna be a motorcycle. Um if that's allowed, uh, fair. I'm gonna buy just have bought a ratty old motorbike. So I think a, a nice ratty old motorbike just to escape and have a little bit of adrenaline and experience. Yep. I'm going to need to have four seats and a degree of practicality because I've got children and a keen interest in mountain biking and camping and things. So I'm going to go with a Series 3 Land Rover that I can work on myself, still do the school run in and play with and enjoy looking at. And it's very functional, cool. and very solid. I'm going to have a, I'm going to have a lovely old Land Rover. And that's what I'm going to drive. Nice. Every day. And a motorbike. And a motorbike I like that for option. the go fast bits. That's me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that. I like that. Okay, what do you think is the most undervalued car at the moment? What should be worth more? I'm going to do a shameless 
bit of product promotion. And I think, <laughs> I think when you see the effort and time that goes into building a plus four and keeping it that competitively priced, considering, I think a Morgan is a very undervalued client. Okay. That's okay. shameless. And there's probably is a lot, a <laughs> That's lot all right. better, That's all right. much more intelligent answers. And, and I mean, there are some beautiful cars at the moment, but that's the yeah. obvious one. That, it's okay. Yeah. I've got I've got a, a, a question coming up that should trip up this shameless plug. <laughs> okay. um, what What's the most interesting car to you at the moment? What are you googling? What are you looking up? Working on? Whatever. Yeah. So we are looking at the moment at a lot of mid-century cars, which I think is quite interesting at the moment. And we're also looking at a lot of modern representations of those cars. What's the most interesting car at the moment that we look at? It's just not one car. We look at so many different vehicles. Mm. Jeez, I need like an hour to think of these answers. So when you say modern representations mm. of like mid-century cars, do you mean things such like the Countach yeah. or the... Um, we've got a bunch of Ferrari remakes coming out and stuff like that's that that's it all of that all of that sort of stuff is really is really relevant um at the moment i think in the last couple of years things like the sp edition ferraris sp1s and sp2s I think yeah the use of big clean surfaces and very mid-century proportioning and stuff like that i think it's really interesting at the moment anything that draws its inspiration from mid-century design which i think is relevant to the people now spending the money on these cars because they can you know, relate to that sort of era of vehicle. Yeah. That for us is quite relevant to Morgan in terms of how we're evolving the Morgan brand with our routings in the early mm. century, more towards the mid-century looking forward. So all sorts of stuff is really interesting there. Um, I, I do think that new Coupache is interesting for sure. Um, yeah, some of the stuff Ferrari have been doing recently, it's been, it's been quite interesting. There have been some really cool, and, and I, my Morgan knowledge is not extensive, but I've definitely over the years seen some very cool kind of what almost looked like design studies, but I know were actually built Yeah, and you could drive them and stuff like that with like crazy sweeping surface interiors That's and it. stuff like that. I can't remember. That's it. There's, there is some, there's some fascinating stuff and where, I mean, we don't, we don't actually commonly look at current automotive trends to define what we're doing or get inspiration from. We do, we mm. do look a lot at, some automotive surfacing type stuff that's being done the way the way mazda and lexus for example are playing with some of the lighting like the lc 500 i think is one of the best looking lexus cars out there yeah. period at the moment um one of the best looking cars out there period at the moment and that's just more due to how they're treating surfacing of cars in unusual and original ways so i think stuff like that is where we find things interesting that others maybe maybe might not um some really strong yeah. bone lines and shoulders and some mazda stuff and really big negative surfacing which is casting the light in unusual ways i think people are realizing that lighting details and 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 graphics on cars can date a car quite quickly and you're getting some really interesting surfacing language appearing at the moment which is interesting to us but not necessarily cars you would yeah. say are you know groundbreaking you be, <laughs> yeah. try and convince somebody that the new quarter panel on a Kia is is the most exciting thing ever and, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and they sort of look at you a bit odd but i really like what they've done with that air yeah, just how they've thrown <laughs> the light around there in a really dynamic way is so exciting and yeah so i guess that's what we're kind of looking at but otherwise we're looking at yeah. anything from fashion to watch design to to boats at the moment we're looking at some a lot of nautical stuff yeah. um aviation things so yeah. cool right final These question hard questions for a designer i hope this one's easier <laughs> five car garage unlimited value five car garage unlimited value okay i'm going to leave the land rover in there because that's just a very useful tool to have yeah um i am going to put morgan's electric three-wheeler in there because i did really love mm -hmm. that that's very exciting i came back after that shakedown day driving that cxt saying Steve, this is going to be the first Morgan I own. No doubt about it. Sell me one immediately because <laughs> I was so blown away by that. And in terms of a bit of go fast overland fun, there is definitely a Morgan CXT yeah. in that garage. No doubt about it. So that's electric, that's electric box. Cool. That's old classic Land Rover for practicality. That's overland venture box. 
I then am going to put in it. Payback did a phenomenal concept car some years ago now that I saw at Villa Deste, which is only ever a concept car. We're going to have to Google and see what that was called. It was a notoriously ridiculous long bonnet on the front of it. Um, oh. Which, uh, names just completely escaped me. But in terms of just sheer size because of the point of it and opulence, that would be the, the ultimate. Was it just called the Vision, Vision 6? That's it, yeah. That's it. Was it Vision 6? <laughs> wow. Yeah, Maybach 6. That's Gabriel. it. That's it. That's nuts. I want one of those. <laughs> that, that is just a yacht on the road. And if you were going to just go and drive across Europe in one hit, that would be what I would do that in. That is very and cool. Then, I like that. I need something. I need something faster. I think my last car, a nice air called 911, I think. Oh. Any of, just because you can't dispute. Any of. Any, you can't, well, no, not about? any of. Um, what do you reckon? <laughs> G-Series, mm. 964. Yeah. 964 is quite like... 964 is, is pretty but... cool, isn't it? That's a bit more understated. 964 would be cool. But early, any early air called 911. Yeah. And would you mess with it? No. Don't think so. Fair enough. No, I think that, I think that's I think that's right. <laughs> there hard, we go. It's in, well, it's in, it's in my mind's my it's mind's tough. wondering for just what those cars are. <laughs> it's impossible, really, isn't it? Well, thanks very much for coming on the podcast. No, thank you, Sam. Just for your time. It's, nice it's, to, uh, it's been good. It's been good. I'm looking forward to seeing. Uh, I don't know when I'll see a CXT some point in time, and uh, and an, an electric Morgan at some point. But yeah, looking forward to seeing seeing what's coming out of your design department. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. <laughs>